Good morning and welcome to Landmark Community Church, Hazel Park, Michigan. It's great to see all of you out for this special occasion. This is the first time we've had a baptismal service in probably oh, three years or so, and it's the first time I can recall in our uh, what, 23, 24 years here on campus that we've ever had an all-male baptism. That's just great. Thank you, guys. And thank you for the commitment you're making to the Lord Jesus. This is the last Sunday of Advent. Over the past uh, three weeks, we've heard messages on hope, on joy, and on faith. Hope, joy, and faith. And it occurred to me that you put all those three together and you'll come up with peace. You can't have peace without joy. You can't have peace without hope. You can't have peace without faith. So we wrap it up this morning with the word peace. John 14, 27 says, Peace I live, leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. And for all that you do, we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Peace is a popular word. We hear it all the time from all sorts of people on all occasions. People want peace. A recent survey uh, across the country, the question was asked, what do you really want in life? What is your number one uh, thing that you want in life? And it came back unanimously, this one word, peace, peace. People want peace in their homes, peace in their families. People want peace in this nation. And yet, we turn our back on the one who gives peace, the only one who gives peace, and that's Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of the world. Someone once said, peace is the brief, glorious moment in history when everybody stands around reloading. And uh, that's so true, isn't it? <laughs> uh, in the last 3,500 years, I am told, that uh, there have been less than 300 years, over 3,500 years, there's less than 300 years of world peace. We have wars breaking out all over the world, conflicts breaking out, and then a few years of peace, and then it breaks back out someplace else. It goes on and on and on. People are trying to find peace in the cities, in the communities, in families, in relationships, and, of course, in the world. And people want some tranquility in their lives and the most intimate relationships. Peace means to be free from trouble, from stress, Fears, threats, anxious, depression, despair, and conflict. Uh, people pursue their peace by diversion, by drugs, by recreation, by entertainment, and by shopping. Although the shopping malls sure don't look good this time. How many peace treaties have been signed, as once asked, and held together throughout history? And the answer is none of them. None of them have held together. Not one peace treaty has held together in all of man's history. People settle for a minimalist definition of peace, and that's a moment's calm, a brief truce, People are even willing to settle for that level of peace in their lives. Only God, through his word, can authoritatively point to real peace. 
In the Old Testament, there's a word that we're all familiar with that, that uh, the Hebrews use for peace, shalom. And, 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 and the word shalom doesn't only mean peace. It means uh, that you're taken care of, that you're cared for, that you're loved deeply, and that, that God's love is, is a blessing upon you. And uh, that is used so many times in the Old Testament, well over 300 times. And when someone said peace, what do they mean? They mean a wish for completeness, contentment, fulfillment, satisfaction, and blessing. It is a de desire that all uh, be good that flows into our life. And we desire that for you as well. The word peace in the New Testament is used 429 times, well more times than in the Old Testament. The New Testament counterpart to that word is a word that literally describes a tranquil state of the soul or a soul at rest. It's the biblical view of peace. The only kind of peace that the world can ever experience is some temporary absence from conflict or some temporary escape from conflict. When Jesus said, I'm giving you my peace, it's not the peace that the world gives to you. That's exactly what he means. He would not be crucified, but that he will be separated from the Father and he will be punished for all the sins of the people through cruc crucifixion and pay for the price of all our sins and bring anybody to peace with God. And people can have peace with God and p the peace of God in their lives because of Jesus. You know, everything that happens to us, every blessing that happens to us, everything that's for our good comes through Jesus Christ himself. Every blessing, every favor comes through him. Every answered prayer comes through Jesus. The only way anybody can have peace nowadays in their lives is to give their lives to Jesus Christ and let him give you the peace that you so long for. He knows that his disciples were distressed. He's telling them on the way to Jerusalem, all the way there, every opportunity that he has, he's telling them that he is going to be uh, tried. He is going to uh, be sentenced to death. He is going to die in humiliation on a cross for the sins of the world. And they didn't understand that. That's the only way they could have peace. That's the only way this world today has peace. It's not going to come through government. It's not going to come through the United Nations. They can't even get together on what time of day it is, much less bring peace to a, a, a warfare-style uh, nation and society all over this world. <laughs> There's no peace. This is his legacy, John 17, 22. Not only for those who are with me, but for all those who will believe. Peace will come to all those who believe. You want peace today? All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ. Give your life to him by faith and you'll have peace. It's a supernatural peace, not a normal peace. It belongs only to those who belong to Jesus. There are four features of this peace that I'd just like to go briefly over with you. Number one, the nature of this peace. The nature of this peace. There are two aspects to this. One is objective and the other is subjective. The objective peace is that peace which is outside of you. Things that impact you that you can't control. They're outside of you. It's a, a transactional peace. Then the subjective peace is that peace which is inside of you. And that's experiential. You experience Christ, and then you experience the peace that he gives to you. You know innately inside of you that it's from heaven, it's from God, and it's very special. John 17, 27 says this, Peace I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. Just think of it, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just think of how you were before you were saved. You ever go back and review that? For me, um, 
I got saved in June of 1957. How many of you were alive June 1957? Whoa. Wow. All right. We got one. We got two. Well, there's only three of us in this great crowd. They're, they're alive, much less uh, saved. And I remember who I was and what I was before I was saved. And I had no peace in my heart, no peace in my life at all. Tried it all. Maybe you did as well. And, and then I heard the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. That God's son was sent here to die for all who will come to him. To pay for all of their sins that through faith we give our hearts and our lives to him. And in return, we get peace. Instantaneously, when I prayed that prayer and gave my life to Jesus Christ, I was a worse sinner in that city. At least that's what some people said. They couldn't believe that this guy got saved. That, that, that the change came instantaneously. And it's been rolling along year after year down to this very day where God takes over a life and let's see, how many years ago was that? I guess uh, about 63 years ago. I'm 82 now. And he saved me and then progressively grew me in the knowledge of God. It's called sanctification. And he changed my life from the inside out. And he gave me peace every single one of those days, regardless of what was going on in my life. Now that's salvation, brother. And that's the only way anybody can get peace. So I recommend it highly to you. God has never failed me since I gave him my life. Ephesians 6.15 says, We have a gospel of peace. The gospel is the gospel of peace. It brings peace between the sinner and God. And you are justified in faith in Christ and by the work that he did for all of us on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sins. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 There's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10 That's all of us. All means all. You're no different. I'm no different. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God has, through his love, made a propitiation, made a sacrifice of his own son. You say, does God love me? He loves you more than you can ever understand. He gave his son, his only son, to die in your place so that you might have peace with him. And all we have to do is reach out and accept that wonderful salvation and the gospel. Romans 5.10 says that we were enemies with God and yet he loves us. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the Bible says you're his enemy. The Bible says in Psalms that he is angry with the wicked every single day. That's, that's not a comfortable place to be in. There's no, there's no peace there. But that can all change. And it can all change the moment that you give your life to peace. So we have the nature of peace. And next we have the source of peace. How are we reconciled to God? Well, Romans 5.11 says, And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation with God. God is a God of peace and reconciliation. God wants to draw you to himself. He wants you to experience this. He wants your life so that he can control what's going on and control the blessings and the favors and so forth that are yours that you inherit when you give your life to him. He put our sins on Christ, and since our sins were paid from full, all we must do is believe and we'll be reconciled with God. Believe in your heart that Christ died for you personally because that's what happened. When he's hanging on that cross... He looked down over the ages of time and he saw you and he saw me and he saw our destination was eternal hell. We don't preach much about that nowadays, do we? We don't say those words, but it hasn't changed. And that's what held him to the cross. Those Roman nails didn't hold him to the cross. He, it was held by love for you. 
He wanted you to have peace. And so he hung on that cross and shed his blood for you personally. How could you turn that away? God can't do any more than that, my friend. He was born to die. And we celebrate his birth this week. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19 says, God who reconciled us to himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, but by not counting their trespasses against them. 2 Corinthians 5.21 said, He made him, Christ, who knew no sin, sin on our behalf. He took on the sins of all humanity, whoever lived and whoever will live. Colossians 1.19 says this, It was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, in Christ, through him, through Christ, to reconcile all things to himself. By having made peace through the blood of his cross, he made peace through the blood of his cross. Amen. Well, Hebrews 13.5 says this, When we come to Christ and we give him our lives, is he going to take care of us? Can I, can I see him walk away because of something I may do? And Hebrews 13, 5 says this. He will never leave us nor forsake us. The entire verse 4 and 5 says this. Um, be, content with, be not covetous, but be content with what you have. For he has said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. Therefore, I can say with confidence, what can man do unto me? When I'm in Christ Jesus, what can man do unto me? Can he threaten me? Can he take my life? Yes, he can take my life, but I'm going on to a far better place. I don't have to fear what man can do unto me. I'm in Christ, the Son of God. <laughs> and that's what the gospel message is all about. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will handle it. I love the song, It Is Well With My Soul. That's the joy we have in being a believer in Jesus Christ. Romans uh, 15.3 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. Hope, joy, and peace. In believing, so that you may abound in hope. Need hope today? You know, all the things that are going on in this crazy world, it's just incredible. I never thought I'd see the day when things are going on that's happening every day now. Corruption everywhere. We can't even trust our own elections. And the outcome of our own elections is just crazy, isn't it? But, but, but it tells me that God's power is the only thing we can trust in. We can't trust in politicians. We can't trust in anybody in authority today. The only one that we can trust is God himself. And we trust him through Jesus Christ and giving our life to him. Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking. <laughs> well, I kind of want to eat and drink a little bit. Not drink alcohol. <laughs> Have some refreshing drinks, I suppose. But it's not, what it means is it's not human. It's not, it's not us sitting around having a jolly good time. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. When we get saved, we get the Holy Spirit. When we get saved, one of the triune gods lives in us. Now, that makes you a somebody, brother. That makes you somebody separated out in Christ and him living in you, guiding you on every decision that you make, leading you, teaching you, helping you, all free of charge. Isn't that great? Christians ought to be the most happy folks in the whole world. I see some Christians, looks like they've been baptized in lemon juice. And they just aren't happy about anything at any time. Oh, woe is me. They go around, oh, woe is me. Oh, come on. You have the peace of God, and you have the uh, peace uh, in your heart with God. What more do you want? 
He'll take care of you and never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. He'll take care of you until the day you step over into glory. What more do you want out of life? <laughs> you get all of this and heaven too. What? Not only do I have God in my heart and in my life here, and he's going to do the best for me here, I step over into glory, and it's eternity with him. Now, you know what happens when you don't have Christ, and you step over into eternity? Yeah. That's the choice right there. That's the that's as black and white, as clear as can be. You're shunning hell, a destiny that no one wants, if they really knew the truth of it. And you're getting heaven, a wonderful prospect of living with Christ, and all the great, great Christians down through all the ages will be there. That's joy and peace that the Holy Spirit gives to us. And you'll be made righteous, the result of that is peace and joy. You're at peace and you're in joy. John 17, 27 says, Peace I give you. It's his peace to give. And many places in the Bible you will find this statement. The God of peace. Just look it up in your concordance and you'll see it's throughout the whole Bible. The God of peace, even in the Old Testament, the God of peace in the New Testament. All 66 books of the Bible have that in it. And the peace that we have is not the peace of the world, it's from heaven. Now, Paul wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. In 12 of those letters, he says, Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All but one. He says that. So it's important. It's important that we grab this concept. We have the God of peace. We have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, and peace, and so forth. Hebrews 12, 2 says this. He went to the cross for the joy that was set before him. In the garden, he was sweating blood of agony. And when Jesus stood before Pilate, he was getting more disturbed, and Pilate was and disoriented and more discontented from any kind of reality. The longer he had to cope with Jesus, John 19.10 says, You do not speak to me? This is Pilate. Don't you know that I have the authority to release you and I have the authority to crucify you? There's all calm and it's stunning. And Jesus says this, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. John 19.11 You don't have to fear anybody. You don't have to fear any threat. Jesus is the only one that has that kind of power. It's trust. God gives a peace that is built in internally reality of a God who can be trusted. Next we'll have the true peace. It's not the kind of peace that the world talks about with this superficial, ignorant fantasy. <laughs> you ever listen to these diplomats and politicians? They don't have a clue of what they're talking about. <laughs> it's ignorant fantasy. I like that. The Bible emphasizes that the world's peace is inadequate. Interesting. Isaiah 48, 22. There is no peace for the wicked, saith the Lord. No peace. Not at all. Uh, Jeremiah 6, 14 says, peace, peace, but there is no peace. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 says, peace and safety, peace and safety. And destruction is going to come on them suddenly like labor pains on a woman with child. And they will not escape. Peace and safety. That's what everybody said in this survey that they wanted. Was peace and safety. And outside of Jesus Christ and outside of the gospel, there is no peace and safety. None at all. Well, people lack Peace, and it's not an emotional issue. It's not a psychological issue. And it's certainly not a secondary issue. It's a primary one for sure. It is a theological issue. Only those who know Jesus Christ and have peace with God and the peace of God have real peace. So we've seen the nature, the source, and true peace. And lastly, it's the pursuit of peace. 
Uh, I'm a dreamer. I like to dream. I like to, uh, I like to dream of, uh, of our new church, our new location. Boy, it's been a long time we've been dreaming that. All new, all set up for the young people, great location. We couldn't bring that about no matter how hard we tried. That had to come through Christ. And it did. And we'll be having some thrilling news when we have our Christmas Eve service. But, but just dream with me. Just, just think about this for a minute. Stop letting your heart be troubled, nor let it be afraid. John 14, 27. Mm. Psalm 34, 14 says, Seek peace and pursue it. Isaiah 32, 17 says, Who steadfastly trust God who are kept in peace. Colossians 3.15 says, Allow the peace of Christ to rule in your hearts. Allow that to happen. Just think of what your life would be like after trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, giving your life over to Him without reservation and let Him take control and let Him run your life for you. Just dream with me for a minute of what that's like. What changes would be made. How you can sleep at night. How you don't fear anything anymore. Because you belong to him. Worrying doesn't help a thing, Jesus says. <laughs> but we live in constant joy when we're a Christian. Philippians 4, 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your meekness, your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. That means he's near to you personally. Philippians uh, 4, 6, and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing. And in all things, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your heart and mind by Christ Jesus. Give it over to him. We can't explain how it works. We don't understand it. All we do is experience it. Stop being anxious for anything. When you pursue righteousness and obedience and thankful prayer, peace follows that. There's a critical uh, component, and I'll end with this, and it's called faith. You go to God during all your troubles because your faith is in, is in His power, His promises, His provisions for you, and in His great love. Greater love hath no man that he give his life for a friend. Jesus Christ gave His life for you personally. He knows you personally. And he wants to be your Lord and your Savior. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect faith, whose mind is fixed on you because he trusts in you. What are you trusting in today? That's a question that you, only you can answer. What do you trust in today? If you're trusting in Jesus, you're safe forevermore. Father, thank you for perfect peace. Thank you, Father that uh, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And we just thank you, Father, that he's just one prayer away. If, you, if you've never uh, gave your life to Jesus Christ, um, there may be someone here that's like that. It's a personal thing between you and Jesus. You're not dealing with this preacher. You're not dealing with this church or any denomination of any sort. You're dealing directly with God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you want peace, if you want to give your life to Him and have peace with Him, silently from your heart to God's heart, you can pray this prayer. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on that cross and paying the price for my sins. I should have hung on that cross and died a terrible death, but you took my place. Thank you so much. And thank you for your death, burial, and resurrection. And now you sit at the right hand of God the Father, ever interceding for us. So I give my life over to you without reservation. I hand it over to you freely. 
Take my life over. Be the king sitting on the throne of my life. I will be subject to you and your sweet love. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. And Father, if there's anybody that prayed that prayer, either here or on the Internet, around the world, they have passed from spiritual death to spiritual life. They are changed within. The Holy Spirit has come and taken residence in them. They've been born into your spiritual family. They belong to you, Father. And now they've taken the first steps to glory. Thank you for what you've done in someone's life here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite the guys to go ahead, go on back and uh, get changed. And it uh, looks like the children are joining us again. Uh, open the door. So if uh, Jonathan and Tanya, if you guys would come join us on the stage here. Um, we don't just get to celebrate baptisms today, but we get to uh, celebrate um, Tanya deciding um, to make a commitment known that she already has um, in front of the church body here. Uh, her intention to dedicate Jonathan to the Lord um, and her commitment to him as uh, her parent his parent, and raising him up. So I'll hand it over to them. You know, there are joys that a pastor has, along with all the other things that we do. <laughs> but seeing people grow, seeing people giving their lives to Jesus Christ, and then growing in him through the different stages they have, it's just a great joy. And uh, it's great to see the blessings that come upon that, right? Like you guys, isn't that great? And uh, we heard your testimony. Boy, that was great. Good job, Bob. And now Jonathan comes along. And Jonathan uh, wants to be dedicated. We did a dedication service several weeks ago. And then he said to his mom, I'd like to be dedicated as well. So we're going to dedicate Jonathan right now. Um, First Samuel... 111 says, Then Hannah made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. That's a vow that Hannah made. Isn't that great? And then Psalms 127, 3 through 5. Behold, children are an heritage of the Lord. And, and here we are slaughtering them every day. Seventy million. And yet the Bible says they're a heritage from the Lord. That, that they are a blessing. All of you parents, I see you parents smiling. Come on there, Dad. There you go. Don't let Mama do all the smiling. Huh? Isn't it wonderful to be a parent? Isn't it wonderful to, as you see your child growing? And, and uh, one of the parents to me said to me today, you know what? I'm so proud of my child. I'm so proud. Isn't that great? And you know what I said? My mother never said those words to me, ever. So I'm so glad. Please tell your child you love them every day. Tell your child you're proud of them every day. Live a life before them that exalts Jesus Christ and see them grow in the Lord. I have some questions for you. I hope you have the right answer. Have you rehearsed your answer? Okay. <laughs> Do you today recognize this child as a gift of God and uh, give a heartfelt thanks for God for his blessing? Oh, yeah. Do you now dedicate your, ch your child to the Lord who gave them to you? surrendering all worldly claims upon their lives in the hope that they will belong wholly to God. Yes. Do you pledge as a parent with God's uh, fatherly help? You will bring up your child in a discipline and instruction of the Lord, making every reasonable effort with patience and love to build the word of God in him and the character of Christ and the joy of the Lord in his life. 
Yeah, God bless you. Do you promise to provide through God's blessings for physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual needs of your child? Uh, looking to your he own Heavenly Father for wisdom, love, and strength to serve him. Yeah, I know you do. You're, you're going to do a great job. Now, congregation, we have a part of this. Do you know? A landmark is a family. All of us are in this together, right? So I have a charge for you. Will you pray for Jonathan and will you encourage him and be an example of mature Christians before him? If so, say we will. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Will you pray for Tanya and the family that the Lord will guide, provide, and bless them? If so, say we will. We will. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Jonathan, let me pray for you and your mother as well. Father, we thank you for Jonathan. What great potential he has. We thank you, Father, that you, you brought him into the family. And we just pray, Father, that you will watch over him, protect him, and help him to mature and early in his life. He'll give his life to Jesus Christ and live for God and be an example to so many other people. We pray for Tanya. And we are grateful for her. And uh, she has a, a, a tough job. But, Father, may you bless her. May you strengthen her. And may you guide her and help her as she raises her family. And for all that you do, in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Is that good? Protestant churches universally agree that there are two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, last week we celebrated the Lord's Supper, and this week we celebrate the ordinance of baptism. The participation in baptism does not save anyone from their sins. One can enter the waters of baptism a dry sinner and emerge a wet sinner. It is essential that one first accepts Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior for salvation from their sins. Baptism is simply an outward expression of total commitment to one's life to Jesus Christ. It is an outward expression of a life that has been changed from the inside out by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Our Lord Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Those who will be baptized today have come and given a testimony of their trusting in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And we congratulate all of you. God bless you is our prayer. Well, we have uh, asked each of these guys if they would be willing um, to share a bit of their story with all of us, just as an extra piece for us to share and um, just how special and how amazing it is what God has done in their lives and bringing them to new life. So. Hi, my name is Brendan. So uh, growing up, it was it was a fun time. It was a rough road, but it was a fun time. Uh, my mom did everything she could to help me, but going through depression and drugs and suicidal thoughts and everything else like that, it, it definitely helped uh, for me to come closer to God. And growing up, my, my mom always answered my questions to about God, about religion, um, one of the biggest things is footprints in the sand. I remember my aunt always having that as a picture on the on the uh, wall. It was just something that always helped me carry through. And I didn't really understand much about it until I got into rodeo and bull riding, and then you really realize, like, hey, there is an, there is an Almighty, there is a there is a Lord and Savior, the King of Kings, the Living God. So. Um, at that point, that's when I decided to give my life to Jesus Christ and 
follow through, and now we're here. So I, I thank every single one of you guys, every single one of you. Thank you for being here for all of us, not just me, but Johnny and everybody here too. So thank you. Hi, my name is Johnny. Um, growing up, uh, I had a lot of stuff going on that wasn't really great. So uh, I was always at, mad at God, kind of blamed him for a lot of what happened in my life. Um, and always trying to do the wrong thing, try to fill in that void of how angry I was at everyone in that God. Um, then I went to this program and I met this pastor named Pastor Dave and he was just talking and he was just teaching us about something and it just really hit and it, and he prayed with me and I was looking to change my life and I want to give my life to God. Have you accepted Jesus as your Savior and come to believe that he has died for your sins? Yes. And is, your, is it your desire today to make that belief public and ah. being baptized to declare that the Lord is over your life? Yes. Amen. It is my honor and pleasure to baptize you. My name is Alex. Um, as I were growing up, I was brought into the church with on and off, on and off type relationship. That was until I got older. My life revolved around me going to parties, revolving myself around the wrong people, and surrounding myself in the wrong type of crowds. This began turning into what I thought was the new normal in my life. It was until I thought was keeping me happy, but in reality, I was just a distraction. After high school, I enlisted in the U.S. Army. I was sent to Colorado for two years where my old habits came with me. Just the only difference was that I moved states. They stayed until I got out of the service and moved back to Michigan where my aunt Rose and Uncle Sid graciously allowed me to stay in their home. Um, that is where they opened up the door to my relationship with God today. After coming before God and asking for forgiveness, I feel like the weight that has been on me for so long got lifted off my shoulders, and I finally felt true peace came over me for the first time. Amen. All right.
Hey everybody, my name is Jared Shirky. So, my life before I came to Christ, I was in a state of constant dread, a lingering cloud of darkness that never seemed to go away. But there was always a consistent yearning deep inside of me, knowing there's something much greater than me. In my quest to find out this great force that I always felt around me, I found myself treading in some pretty murky waters. I started to really identify with some of the ideas of the New Age movement, getting my hands on any spiritual books I could find. I was also using substances to alter my mind because crazy enough, I thought it was doing something to benefit me. But deep down, there was a void that no matter what I did, I couldn't fill. Those things were temporary and the emotional highs quickly dwindled. When I was about 12 years old, is the first time I can really remember going to a church and it felt very foreign to me because in my family, we didn't practice any type of religion. It wasn't until I was a little older and I was provided with an experience to be able to see the power of Jesus Christ, the true power he has over the enemy we face. For those that don't know, it's spread within that New Age community that religion is a control system designed to keep you limited, so that's what I thought. My Aunt Rose and Uncle Sid truly opened the door for me to know Christ. Without them, I would not be standing here today. Truly, my second set of parents are led by example. Seeing the beauty that unfolded in their lives with their relationship with Christ really got my attention. And my aunt sent me a video about a young man exactly like me who came out of that movement and gave his life to Christ. That was the very moment that everything changed inside of me and it clicked. I truly, it truly clicked for the first time. At the same time, I was watching God work absolute miracles on my father fighting for his life in the hospital. There was simply no longer denying it. And with open arms, you amazing people right here at this church accepted me. It made me feel like I belong for the first time. In my short time since coming to Christ, I finally feel as if my life has a purpose. That deep void I had always felt has finally been filled. That cloud I thought would never leave finally passed. Now I'm driven to learn as much about the gospel as I possibly can to move this kingdom forward, to be a vessel for God to work through. To continue removing layers of myself that need to be shed, to be the man and the father I've always wanted to be. And even though things aren't great, things aren't perfect, I still mess up and I still catch myself slipping into old thoughts and old patterns. I know that the love of Christ will keep me grounded. He will be the beacon of light that guides me back to his kingdom one day. Thank you all so much. Amen. Jared, have you accepted Jesus Christ as a savior?